Hello folks, welcome back to part two of 2022 National Five. First of all, uh, my channel cannot be monetized, so I'm not making any money out of it. This is done purely for educational reasons. Number two, these are not the official answers. At the time of recording, they haven't been released yet from the SQA, so these are just my guesses, which means you can't use them to accurately estimate your mark, I'm afraid. This is GIF for information. I'm going to be doing this fairly quickly. I, I'll zip through the simple KU questions, the knowledge stuff, and I'll spend more time on the problem-solving questions. So let's start. That particle there is a beta particle. It does say name. I've just written that. I should have written beta, but I think you'll probably get away with that. Element Y. Well, 131. Uh, 0 on this side, that has to be 131. 53 on this side, that has to be 54, because if you add the negative 1 to it, you get 53, which is xenon. Half-lives of three isotopes shown in the table. Half-life calculations, guys. Calculate the length of time taken for xenon-133. Uh, oh, right, three different half-lives to pick from. Yeah, that's why it's worth two marks. To fall to an eighth of its value, so you start at one, and go down to a half, and then a quarter, then an eighth. And each of these drops takes five days, so therefore the total is 15 days. I think you probably need to include the unit on this one, because that's why that's in years, to stop you just putting 15. It's a sneaky question. I do like that one, actually. It's a nice question. Suggest which would be responsible for long-term radiation. Well, obviously, it's the one with the longest half-life, which was cesium-137. You don't have to say why. It's only worth, sorry, it's only worth one mark. Drawing a graph. This is an interesting one because they actually give you the oops, sorry. Noise in the background. They actually give you the scales and the units. The, sorry, the labels. My, uh, my apologies. And the units for both the um, dependent and independent variable. Um, perhaps that's why it's only worth two marks. Literally, all you have to do. In fact, they even give you the starting point, which helps you to allocate the numbers. Yeah, that's an easy two marks. Wow, okay. Uh, it looks like that. Um, number 2B, reaction rate. They've actually given you the unit here, which is unusual. Usually they get you to work that one out. So um, they're definitely being generous in this paper so far. The rate is equal to the change in volume over the change in time, which according to my uh, graph was... Um, in fact, according to these numbers here. Sorry, that's how you work it out. Between one and four minutes. It's 48, take away 32. Perhaps you might have fallen into the trick of dividing by 4 in the bottom line there, which is an interesting one, but it is, technically speaking, only over 3 minutes, which comes out to be 5.33. That's an unusual number. Suggest a different measurement that could be used to follow the progress of this reaction. Well, this reaction is giving off gas, which means you could measure the weight of the beaker. As time goes on, the mass of the beaker will drop um, rather than collecting the volume of gas. That's a tough one, actually. Um, see how many people got that one right. A student repeated the experiment at a higher temperature using the same mass of calcium and the same volume of water. The only thing that has changed is the temperature. That will have no effect then. This is almost a trick question. On the final volume of gas, it will still be 48 centimetres cubed. You'll just get that 48 centimetres cubed faster. Just in case they ever ask it in the future, they might. if it was me, I would ask perhaps, rather than asking for the final number, I would have asked to sketch the shape of the graph so you would have a shape that rises up faster here but flattens out on the same point. Uh, number three. Oh, it's the close reading type questions, isn't it? Well, we'll skip through these very simple. Ammonia and carbon dioxide, you just need to read it. Read the question. Uh, calculate the mass of urea used to make five kilograms. It's a 32.5% solution. So 32.5% uh, of 5 is 1 point, and it gives you the kilograms, so 1.625. Um, it's hydrogen and hydroxide. Um, oh, that's testing your knowledge of uh, acids. That's what that's testing. That's not part of the close reading. This is sort of semi-problem solving, is it? No, it mentions it. Yeah, it's close reading. It's non-toxic and it's non-flammable. I would imagine either of these two. It just says state A reason. Another use of urea as a fertilizer. Diammonium hydrogen phosphate is another common fertilizer. Why is it not classified as a single nutrient fertilizer? Because it contains two of the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. And lastly, percentage mass calculations. These are an easy three marks if you know how to do them. Um, the only thing to watch for here is there are two of the NH4s. 
which means you've actually got two nitrogens here on the top line, and uh, divided by the GFM, 21.2%. Number four. And then the type of reaction, it's addition, doubles, singles. That's how you know it's addition. Draw a molecule of hydrogen bromide. Unusual, this, and a little bit nasty, because bromine is quite far down. It's past number 20, which means if you try and do the 288 thing, you can confuse yourself here. So just go with the fact that bromine's in group 7. It will have seven outer electrons. Hydrogen's got one. There you go. And then the chemical that can be reacted with the ethene to make chloroethene. Well, if you're starting with ethene and you want to make chloroethene, this is a sort of problem that I've said tricky here. Yeah, this is tricky because we don't normally go into the details of this. But if HBr makes bromoethane, then HCl would make chloroethane. Uh, so HCl or hydrogen chloride, either one of these two. Yeah, it's a tough one, that one. Draw the structure of oh, problem solving. And we've never seen this before. Never seen this uh, malarkey here before. Um, but you can work out that we're taking a bromine and then the bromine disappears and then we've got this weird thing on instead of the bromine. And then this weird thing gets converted into this. So, if you want to make this, we're working backwards. So we'd end up with uh, a CH3 and then this weird triple bond, and then we started with this. Problem solving, it's a tough question, this one. Quite a difficult one, that one. The, this is a simple KU, it's vinegar. You just need to know that. Dilute ethanoic acid is vinegar. We'll maybe come back to these at the end. We'll come back to the open-enders at the end, if I remember. 2-methylbutane, yeah, they're pulling the trick here. They're pulling the trick of drawing it confusingly, so it looks like you should just go with these three, but if you find the longest continuous chain, it's got four carbons in it. So I've redrawn it here effectively like that. Straighten that out. That is 2-methylbutane. Um, simple knowledge here. Substance that burns is a fuel, releasing energy. This is a tough one, tough balancing one. Some big numbers in here, but these are the numbers that you should have got, guys. Um, energy, oh yeah, it's a CM delta T uh, question here. Normally these are tricky, and there are often some distractors. That's why it's worth three marks. And I've scored these out because these have nothing to do with the top two numbers they've given you, total distractors. Uh, don't forget to turn 200 grams into kilograms, and that's a difference of 12 Celsius, and that's your answer. Don't need the unit because the unit's in the question. Yeah, I've questioned here. I wonder what details the SQ will be looking for on this one. Because I think this is quite a tough one. These are, the de these are the details, sorry, that I think I would want to see. Some sort of shield to keep the heat in. Um, do you have to label that as a copper can? Which I haven't actually labelled, interestingly. Um, I reckon that would need to be labelled as a metal can with water in it and a thermometer. But I'm not sure on that, and I'm not sure how the marks are going to be allocated. I'm not changing colour to keep you awake here, by the way. I'm just changing colour because I've done this over different hours. Uh, this was a tough one because we're effectively combining both of the triangles, the mole triangles, in order to calculate the answers, which is probably why it's worth three marks here. So we're sort of working in reverse. We've been given the concentration. We've been given the volume. Um, so I personally, don't forget to turn that into litres. Uh, I worked at the number of moles required here. And then, last of all, because we now know the moles and we can work out the GFM, once I work it out correctly, then you can work out the mass of sodium chloride required. I, I did say in grams here, so I haven't put any unit here. Name the piece of apparatus used to accurately measure the mass. The mass. These, this is an alternating, really tricky, really simple, which I'm never sh sure is a great plan <clears throat> because you might overthink this. It's just a balance. Would they let you off with a set of scales? I'm not sure. I've said this is an unusual question <clears throat> because you're actually asked to calculate an average. Never before in National 5 that I can remember have has it ever been tested to see if you can calculate averages. It does say so in the specifications. Um, and it makes me wonder if the SQA are thinking of deleting the assignment and including the skills in the actual exam paper. Anyway, 
Um, it's 106.67. Now, technically speaking, these are three significant figures, so they should just accept 107 Celsius, but I don't know for sure. I haven't seen the marking scheme yet. Uh, yeah, this this is another equally. I've, I've said this is a whole unusual question here. That's right. This is this is is this assignment replacement time? Anyway, moving on. Uh, present these results in a table. So draw a table like this, complete with headings and units um, at different concentrations. Sorry, not different concentrations. Yeah, these are the numbers here. Sorry, you have to pop these numbers into this table here, not forgetting to include this one. A type of graph? Type of graph? Yeah, line graph, because it's two sets of numbers. That's why it's a line graph. Technically speaking, these are two discontinuous variables. And D, yeah, the higher the concentration, the higher the boiling point from these numbers. Or vice versa, of course. Lower concentration, lower boiling point. Problem solving, sort of flowchart uh, type question. There's always one of these. Uh, this must be sulfuric acid because sulfuric acid plus barium hydroxide would make barium sulfate. That's how I know it's sulfuric acid. That's a hydroxide. This um, this is a neutralization reaction. Gas B. Uh, if you react a metal with an acid, you make a salt. Am I on screen? Yes, I am. A salt and hydrogen gas. And what's going on here? Sodium carbonate is added until the reaction is finished, other than measuring the pH. Suggest how the student would know when... Oh, how suggest how you know when the reaction's done. Well, I've said here, no more bubbles, or unreacted solid is left behind in the beaker. I think either of these two should be accepted. Although, again, I can't guarantee this. Barium sulfate is insoluble. You just need to use the data book. Um, I see they've stopped uh, quoting the page in the data book. And down here, magnesium and dilute acid cannot be classified as a neutralisation. State what is meant by neutralization. I wasn't sure what they're looking for here. My definition in my head of a neutralization reaction is when you react an acid with a base and you make a salt uh, as a product. Sometimes you make water as well. It depends. Most bases make water, but not all of them. So presumably acid plus base makes salt, but I'm not sure what they're looking for in that one. Isotope. Very simple. Different, same atomic number, different mass number. Or the same protons, different neutrons. Noble gases are unreactive because their outer layer is already full up. Whoops. And it goes on to say, however, under certain conditions, you can actually form compounds of xenon. I wasn't sure what they were looking for this one. Chemical equation. Xenon difluoride. Now this is interesting because they're using prefixes here for the first time ever, I think. So they're expecting you to know that difluoride means it's XeF2 is reacted with fluorine gas to make xenon hexafluoride, which is this, XeF6, which they have given you. Now, the quoted nickel-2 fluoride is the catalyst. Now, in chemistry, we write catalysts above the arrow, but I don't know whether that will be needed. I seriously doubt that. I really doubt that, especially for one mark. Um, xenon hexafluoride is a solid at room temperature, but it melts at just 49 Celsius. So covalent molecules, that's the bonding and the structure. You can say discrete molecules as well. I would imagine that should be totally acceptable. Or separate molecules, it's all the same thing. What you couldn't say is giant covalent network, because that's wrong. Now, this is almost a trick question, again on catalysis. Nickel-2 fluoride is a catalyst. It does not get used up, so therefore you would get 35 grams at the start, 35 grams at the end. Do you need the unit? I don't know. I'd be really interested to see because it doesn't quote the unit in the question. Um, this is an interesting problem solving as well. The cost in pounds of purchasing the required mass of nickel fluoride, you can only buy it in 10 gram tubs. Now, we needed... Um, Hold on. Yeah, we need 35 grams of nickel fluoride. You can only buy it in 10 gram tubs. You're going to need four tubs, which according to my sums would cost us £277.60. What a weird problem solving question that one is. Number 10. Um, homologous series. I don't know how many properties they're looking for here. It's only worth one mark, but traditionally they wanted two 
properties of homologous series. So general formula, regular increase in boiling points, similar chemical reactions, I'm not sure. Uh, any two I personally would have put, maybe, they're only, maybe they'll only need one. We'll have to wait and see. This I thought was a tricky problem solving. Alcohols can be classified depending on how many hydrogen atoms are attached to the carbon atom bonded to the functional group. They have circled the carbon to try and help you here. Um, this one here is called a primary. And as we can see, it has got two hydrogens attached to the carbon, attached to the functional group. This one here is called secondary. It's only got one carbon. And this one here is called tertiary or thirdary. <laughs> And it's got no hydrogens attached to the circled carbon. First of all, they're easing you in gently here. They're asking you to name the functional group, which is just hydroxyl. Then they've given you this one here and asked you to classify it. Well, it's got one hydrogen attached to this carbon here, so it's classified as a secondary alcohol. Tough one, though. It is a tough one. Draw an isomer of 3-methylbutantool, so that's this one, which has a different classification. Again, this is a tough one, um, but I would have put... Um, five carbons in a line and a hydroxyl just on the end here. Or any other alternative version of that, provided it's got the same formula, but a different arrangement and a different classification as well. So, tricky. Tricky one. Screaming Jelly Baby. Uh, oxygen's test is it relights a glowing splint. Write the formula for potassium chlorate showing the charge on both ions. I thought this was tricky because you've never come ac across this chlorate ion. They're, they haven't even put, I, because I'm an old uh, fart, I tend to put brackets here on the complex ions and they haven't even done that there. So how do you know that it's not some sort of weird combination of potassium and chloride? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that question at all. I don't think it's a good question, personally. Um, if you put brackets around it, it'd be more forgivable. You could have worked out the potassium is positive, so therefore this, whatever this is, must be negative. We'll see how that one works out in the assessor's report when that comes out. Jelly Baby is added to the reaction. Uh, it gives out energy if it's exothermic. You have to use your flame colours in the data book here. And it's uh, there's potassium in the compound if you've got a lilac flame. The reaction of sugar. Uh, this is one of these ones where you're calculating the mass. Oh, yeah. This is a horrible question. Because there's... An there's not an easy divider. Well, there is. It's 80. But this is a horrendous divider. I've said this is a horrible question. This is so different to every other reaction mass question I've ever seen. And it's not the 1 to 6. That's unusual. But the unusual thing is the divider here. Three marks. We'll see how well people got on with that. Again, assessor's report time. I'd love to see how many people get full marks on that one. Uh, this is another... What I've said as horrible question. This, it's not the, the concept of testing here, that's lifted from higher, but that's not a problem, provided you've made the problem solving question easy enough, SQA. Have you made it clear enough? I personally, and it's just my personal opinion, don't think so. But let's have a look. Sodium to chlorine. So there's sodium, 160. Um, whatever that's measured in, it does say here, picometers. So 160 going across to 100. Generally speaking, the trend here is decreasing. That's okay. It's a nice easy start. General trend in bold, going down a group. Well, if you go down this group here, uh, we see an increase. If we go down this group here, we see an increase so far. Not sure about that one. Yep. So again, okay, this one's fine. I'd say increasing is a general trend. But this one here, I have no clue on what range they're going to accept. I thought it was a horrible question. I think they'd have to accept a larger range because if we just look at... Is that on screen? Yes, it is. If we look at group 2 only, then that drops by 41. Then we have a drop of... Sorry, an increase of 41. My apologies. Then an increase of 34. So are we looking for another increase somewhere between... 34 and 41. However, if you look at group 1, we find an increase of 30 and then 40 and then it only increases by 15. So I'm not sure what 
I honestly don't know. I think I'll just put that as a potluck guess and we'll see what they actually end up accepting. Uh, this is a read the flipping question time because the covalent radius is defined as half the distance between the two nuclei. They give you, um, calculate the distance between the two nuclei and bromine. Well, bromine is 117 according to this. And that is defined as half the distance, so you're multiplying by 2, you get 234. Don't need to give the unit, it's in the question. The radius, sorry, the radius of the sodium ion is smaller than the radius of the sodium atom. Uh, they're asking you to uh, write out the arrangement for the sodium atom. It's 2, 8. You've lost the 1 on the outer side. And here, of course, it's asking you to explain why. There are only two layers of electrons in the ion. And do you need to see three layers in the atom? I'm not sure, because it's only worth one mark. Oh, yeah, open-enders. This one is about... I love this question. This is a really nicely written question. It almost makes up for that horrible problem-solving one because it's this is the true definition of an open-ended question. You can talk about redox, any three things you would like to talk about redox. I personally might have done the definitions of reduction and oxidation first. They love to see examples, equations. So you could do a little example of an equation. Let me get one. So you could have popped in with uh, any of these two. We've got magnesium. You could see that's being oxidized. You could explain why it's being oxidized. Um, this is a reduction and why it's a reduction. You could talk about the fact that you can recognize an oxidation because the electrons on the right of the arrow and reduction are on the left. You could then talk about joining up these two. You could then talk about how to combine these two into an overall redox equation. That would certainly give you the third mark. Uh, this is an easy one to get three marks in. Let's have a look at the other one. So this is basically uh, neutralizing calcium carbonate. I think I'd be tempted to talk about, this is slightly more closed, but still a good question, this one. These three topics jump to mind for the three points. You could talk about titration, the reaction about titration. You could draw a little set of equipment where you have a burette, you have your conical flask. Um, you could explain, you could pop a tablet in here. You could drop acid onto it. By the way, if you're a chemistry teacher, I know you can't do that. Don't shout at me. We'll come back to back titrations in the sixth year. Um, but with this frame of reference for what you guys currently know in fourth year, that would do just fine. You could talk about concordant values. You could talk about um, indicators. Titration, easily get you one mark. Change in mass, that's another way you could do it. You could, just like the question earlier on, interestingly, two questions very similar to each other in the same paper. So you can have your uh, indigestion tablet here on the scales. It will bubble and give off mass, and this reading here will drop on your scale. So whatever reading that says, that will drop down. And lastly, you could draw a set of equipment about capturing the gas. So you could do the old bubbling the gas through the water or use a gas syringe. Um, that would easily get your three marks. If you wanted to really show off, you could round it off with explaining that the one that gave off the most gas or the one that required the most acid is the one that would neutralize acid most efficiently. Right, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.